It is indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, Arun is fungible. He can do almost anything. I saw him at ARPA-E, and I had the pleasure of serving on an advisory committee with him at ARPA-E. But I want to comment to the students in this class how lucky you are in this classroom, how lucky you are to be here. My son, who I happen to be a little biased, I think he's a pretty bright kid, uh, he got early acceptance into Harvard. Uh, he he got uh, he was uh, a world class rower. He he made the U.S. national team rowing, and he applied at Stanford. He was going to come to Stanford, but he didn't get in. So he went on and got a scholarship to go to Oxford, uh, an academic scholarship. But it was really he's a row scholar. He he really went so he could row another year. So he rowed for Christ Church. And worked here in San Francisco two years, did two startups, applied for an MBA program here at Stanford, and didn't get in. <laughs> he applied at Oxford and Harvard and was able to get in without any problems. So congratulations to the students. <laughs> that, is, that is saying something for uh, how tough it is to get into this school. But I want to talk about uh, the power grid, and I title it, uh, the future ain't what it used to be because we're seeing probably the most rapid change to um, how things are operating across the grid. Uh, Arun has covered this. Uh, PJM, my former sponsor uh, that uh, I worked for for the last eight years, the most important number on this screen is 21% of the GDP in North America is in that one grid. So you can imagine the economic impact, the importance that the grid operation, the efficiency of the grid, and electricity is one where efficiency really matters in terms of the cost of energy and how uh, the grid operates. But uh, bottom line is uh, already, uh, Arun has already alluded to, what is the single most important engineering achievement of the last century? The National Academy of Engineering, which Arun is a proud member of as well, uh, said electricity and electrification has done more to improve our standard of living. It's, it's a lifeline uh, to our homes and the lifeblood of our economy. Nothing has improved our productivity or uh, our standard of living more than electricity. Uh, and, and I might add, of the top 10, six of the remaining engineering achievements are fueled by electricity. Fun things like computers and TVs and some fairly important things like refrigeration for our food, no botulism, like water treatment, no cholera, the ability to have as many people working productively in North America. If we're smart, and I think we are, uh, and uh, Elon Musk is working with me on this, electrification of automobiles. I'm going to talk about it a little bit and how important it is. Now, you hear a lot about distribution system and microgrids. I, I know uh, you, you've, uh, those of you that are in the engineering department, how long do you think it will take to build a microgrid? I know the answer to this. It's about five days. This is Superstorm Sandy. This is Wall Street. Uh, cables laid in the street. Uh, it took about five days. To, to build out that microgrid. And we had Wall Street back up and running. Uh, there's something about as-built drawings that we're missing, I might add, and uh, there's a few things you don't like, but the importance of when Superstorm Sandy came through, 8.3 million people were in the dark. And, but I wanna emphasize efficiency matters in this business, and I wanna zoom in on a micro microgrid in the middle here. Uh, this guy has found a market, a niche market. He's charging iPhones. Uh, I looked at him. I said, hmm, pretty lean and mean. He could be a rower. He could, he could row for Stanford, I bet. <laughs> uh, but uh, you look at the efficiency. It's obviously an internal combustion process that he's using here. Uh, I gave him about 20% efficiency on the conversion of calories to energy. I gave the bicycle 95%. It looked pretty good in terms of the chain drive and uh, but that's an 18,000 BTU machine at, per kilowatt hour. 
A combined cycle gas plant runs about 6,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour, three times as efficient. But that's not the problem on this. The problem is in the background. 99 cent pizza. Now that's pretty cheap. I figure 300 calories is the best you can do with 99 cent pizza. He can charge about three or four iPhone 6 with one slice of pizza. But if you used him in your home, and your home's about 3,000 square feet, say, your power bill would be $35,000 per month. And that's mostly pizza costs, not to mention the, the labor. So how efficient the grid is makes a lot of difference. Uh, and how secure it is makes a lot of difference. And, and by the way, that is a pizza place in Washington. The fuel is what they call the pizza place. Things that keep me awake at night as being a CEO of the largest grid operator are the big events that happen and impact the grid. Obviously, Fukushima, I'll talk a little bit about that. Derechos, which I didn't know what was 15 years ago. I know quite well what they are now. Hurricane Sandy, Sandy and we just went through the solar storm, so earth and solar weather. Uh, cyber and physical security, including uh, electromagnetic pulses, are the big black sky events that we worry about across the system. Now, I was trying to think, uh, which substations do you think we need to protect? <laughs> Metcalf uh, is right here in your backyard. There was an attack on Metcalf. FBI reenacted the attack. It may have been one person, maximum two people that did that attack. There's 45,000 substations, all of which you've got cyber and physical security concerns. So, uh, so I tried to visualize what are you up against if you're up against a cyber attack. It's not easy. Here's the way I visualized it. Anybody recognize? This is from Star Wars. Uh, I was questioned whether I had copyright rights to use this picture, but I can tell you it was uh, so, so long ago. But this is the internet as I saw it last Friday. It is not a very happy place to be doing business. A lot of the controls and markets and whole business economy. So there's, there is trillions of dollars a day of energy and market trading going under, under the Atlantic Ocean on fiber optic cable each and every day. So. Uh, this, the being able to protect the system for physical and cyber security is becoming a very high priority as we go forward. Uh, we've met with some of your computer science security folks today. My vision is that you move to a cloud computing, but it's a private cloud. It's under an iron dome and I uh, show Titan computer. I'm, this is an 18 megawatt computer. I measure computers differently than the computer science department. But this is a supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Labs. It, it is, I think, the fastest computer in the world right now. It was last year. But how can we do the computational needs with parallel processing in a very secure environment that uses dark fiber that we already own to a large extent to be in a secure, high-performance high computing environment for the analytics on the grid? Private cloud, cloud computing is very efficient in my mind. Uh, I prefer uh, it being under an iron dome. Uh, I know Google will, and Amazon and others will tell you that you can secure uh, a cloud computing. But uh, if I don't know where my data is and which computers it's running on, it makes me very nervous when I think about it. But it's a partnership between the universities to write the parallel processing code that we need, uh, and the national labs is the way I see that going. I want to hit on what are the major uncertainties uh, we're uh, faced with today. Uh, what is the demand for electricity going to be, uh, driven in part by uh, Elon Musk and, and what's happening here in the development of uh, electric vehicles. Extreme earth and space weather, I'm going to hit that pretty hard. Uh, the largest fuel switch as we move from coal being the backbone of the system to natural gas and renewables being the backbone of the system and the intermittency of that. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the polar vortex and what happened with natural gas in 2014 uh, and some solutions in terms of integration of demand side management. I started my career 
writing software to send control signals to generating plants for economic dispatch and control, EDC. On, as the load changed, we would send signals to the generator. Now we're sending signals to the load as the intermittent generators change. Same kind of process, it's just a little harder when you have 10 million different devices that you have to send to as opposed. And then kind of the grid of the future, uh, I see HVDC as, as a big solution. And every one of these challenges involve not just IT, but IT and communication. How do you secure the communication system as well? How hot was it? Now let's talk about weather weirding. Uh, the summer of 2011, I was actually uh, in charge of the power system. It went to 108 degrees in New York, 108 degrees in New Jersey. It was 106 in my hometown, Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C., and Richmond. It was so hot in Hershey, Pennsylvania, where they make the milk chocolate. The cows were given and evaporated milk, and by the time we could get it over to the shore, <laughs> Uh, down the shore in Jersey, uh, it looked a little like this. This is not Phoenix. There's a Gulf Stream. There's an ocean. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Here's one of my partners from PNNL. Uh, the, uh, so it was the hottest day ever measured in the history of, uh, of the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, so on weather, strange conditions. Here's another storm. Uh, it, I was actually in Paris, and before I could fly, from the Seagree meeting in Paris, the, this storm had moved from Chicago to Washington, D.C. 200 miles wide, 600 miles long, 100 mile an hour peak, wind, straight line winds, derecho uh, means straight line winds. Uh, the largest storm, 90, large transmission lines on the ground, 4.2 million people in the dark. And yes, we committed a billion dollars to harden the grid in Washington, D.C. Uh, following this storm. The biggest one that I've ever worked, bigger than Katrina, I worked Katrina in the southeast, uh, as a matter of fact, was Hurricane Sandy. Anybody see PJM on this map? It's kind of covered up. <laughs> uh, bottom line, uh, this storm was not a hurricane. It came in at 75 mile an hour winds. We didn't have to shut down any nuclear plants along the coast, which we thought we would. High voltage was our biggest problem, uh, and then no voltage became a very serious problem uh, during the storm uh, as uh, the system came through. Right after the storm, we committed $1.2 billion in New Jersey and $1 billion in New York to harden the system, uh, raise substations, seawalls around substations. Uh, this month, Matthew, I don't know if you all were following the news, I was closely. Uh, mostly water, the, the right front uh, quadrant where the heavy winds are stayed out at sea as it came up the coast. Uh, it, uh, 143 mile an hour winds uh, as it was working its way onto the coast uh, at the seawall. That's nothing, folks. This is typhoon high end. This is the fastest wind speeds ever measured when a storm came ashore. Uh, and over 5,000 people died. There wasn't a leaf left on the trees because the trees were gone in the Philippines when this storm hit. So those that say, hey, weather is not getting stranger, I haven't looked hard at where the data is these days. Polar vortex. Uh, you know, I've been working in Alberta on shutting down the coal fleet there. They call polar vortex in Alberta winter. Uh, in New Jersey, it was cold. Uh, I I've, I've believe we got down to a minus eight degrees in Philly, a minus 20 degrees in the Midwest. It was so cold, the cows in Hershey, Pennsylvania, where they make milk chocolate, were giving uh, chocolate ice cream. Uh, this was a terrible day. The worst day I've ever had on the power system, by the way. 43% of the gas plants would not run. Almost half of them could not get fuel at any price. Natural gas on the gas pipeline. Home heating has priority over electric generation. Natural gas more seriously. The plants that were dual fuel had not seen this kind of weather in at least two decades. And the fuel systems froze up on the trace heaters. And we learned a lot about the importance of 
winterizing the plants uh, before such an extreme event on the system. Uh, this event was forecasted. We had a pretty good forecast. Uh, but the performance, uh, and, and the same thing would happen here in San Francisco if you had extraordinarily cold weather. It happened in Florida, Black Christmas 2009. It happened in Texas uh, as well. Uh, space weather, uh, I'm not the kind of guy that says the sky is falling, but it really is. Uh, <laughs> millions of tons of uh, particles come our way every time there's a solar uh, storm uh, event. We were very fortunate. Uh, in this last solar cycle, and where you never know, uh, some of the extreme solar events can happen off cycle, but it's 11 year cycle. I've worked on uh, four, 44 years I've worked on solar events. We work on it very hard every, every 11 years, and, but at the end of the day, uh, a solar event like the Carrington event of 1859 was the last time we had a severe event that actually melted down the telegraph wires and, uh, called all kinds of problems. There was no power outages then, I might add, because there was no power system. Renewables is the answer. This is the PJM wind out, uh, build out. Uh, we have in our queue uh, enough wind to meet the RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standards, for all the states in the 13 state region. And I'll be frank with you, uh, I like wind a lot. I like the fuel cost. But uh, is I was telling Robert, if you like wind, you got to love storage. Uh, and uh, I, because the wind and solar are intermittent resources and we use electricity in a different way. Anybody see the problem here? This is the PJM average load factor for a year. Uh, and that is the hourly average. So if I gave you two second data, it would be worse than that. But you can see the variability, the intermittency of that resource. Uh, and when you get to 50% of it here in California, you're going to need storage. I really like pump storage. I wrote my graduate thesis on the optimization of Raccoon Mountain Pump Storage Plant, a 1,700 megawatt plant. Uh, uh, Robert here worked on the compressed air energy plant. That's, uh, he was project manager almost on it uh, uh, down in L.A., lower Alabama. McIntosh, Alabama is the location of this. We have a 20 megawatt flywheel. I love this battery. It's a one megawatt uh, lithium ion titanate battery. We did 250,000 swings on it to, to do low frequency control on the PJM system. I love my job, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I met with AES and I said, I want to see this, I want to see it happen, I want to see it outside my window and I want to see it soon. Uh, being CEO, you know, it was kind of a nice thought. Three days later, there's a lineman punching that hole in the ground for that pole. And the, uh, the tractor trailer rolled in in less than a week. It took us longer to get Comcast in to give us broadband to the thing <laughs> than it did to do a 34 kV connection to the system. Mobile batteries I'm going to talk about. That's my Chevy Volt, uh, number 11 off the uh, line. And uh, obviously, uh, when, you, when you think about water heaters and the fact that we have them connected to the system. This is the first commercial fleet of electric vehicles uh, anywhere on the grid, anywhere. Uh, we have uh, the University of Delaware and uh, NRG and PJM have a program where we're paying cars to do load frequency control. So as the wind changes, we actually change the charging on the car so that we can balance out the grid and pay them about $150 a month per car. That won't pay for the car, but it'll pay for the battery. And so uh, we have a program using cars in low frequency control. If you look at carbon, which I think we've got to take a look at all forms of carbon, 26% of the carbons comes from automobiles, transportation. You don't hear a lot of talk about that in Washington, D.C. We love our cars. Uh, I'm serious, you don't talk about it. If we electrify those cars, which we can, they'll be much more efficient, uh, and we can use wind, solar, shale gas, which has 50% of the carbon uh, as uh, a coal plant to, to run those vehicles. This is the growth curve. Uh, my Chevy Volt is down here in 2010, and then I bought a Cadillac ELR in 2014. That's a Chevy Volt with leather seats. That's, it's, uh, it's the exact same drive uh, as the Chevy Volt, but uh, a little nicer. If I had 400,000 cars, which already exist in North America, I could have, 
enough to do load frequency control across the 13 states of PJM. If we had those on load control with a broadband connection to them, we could control the grid and the intermittency of the wind. So as we look at cars, it's more than just the economics of electricity being more efficient. It's also allowing the integration of the renewable resources. Uh, Nissan is considering EVs for uh, emergency backup. Uh, in essence, having an uninterruptible power supply with your EV being part of that. Uh, we have 300 megawatts of battery storage, lithium ion primarily, uh, hooked to PJM. That is enough to do most of the very rapid uh, load frequency control. If you're in the battery business, don't go to PJM. It's saturating. That market will saturate with time, but it says in a very short period of time since we hooked that one megawatt trailer up, we've gone to enough to do load frequency control for the whole system. This is my favorite of all storages because it already exists. It's in your basement, it's in your attic, it's in your garage. It's uh, doing load frequency control with water heaters. In France, where they're primarily nuclear, 70 plus percent nuclear capacity, 50% of the water heaters are under control so that you can charge at night, you can vary the charge rates on those water heaters. Uh, these exist. Uh, that one is actually in my basement. They gave it to me as a gag gift uh, at PJM as a retirement gift, and they didn't know I was going to take it home, <laughs> but I moved it back to Tennessee. Uh, but uh, that water heater, and this is a large tank, in 105 gallon, stores 26 kilowatt hours. My Chevy Volt stores 16. My Cadillac stores 16 and a half. There's 53 million of these hooked to the grid if we controlled half of them, which roughly would have some kind of broadband connection to, we would have the equivalent of all the pump storage, 23 gigawatts, if I'm correct, Robert could correct me, in that range, uh, pump storage that we built out on the grid to enable the nuclear plants. We are converting very quickly to natural gas. Uh, we have reduced carbon more than Europe due to the availability of shale by gas, uh, both the Marcellus, uh, Shell and the Utica shell are coming into play in a big way as we look at it. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about CO2. I just came from uh, Alberta, Canada, did a debrief uh, of the Premier last week. They have decided to put a price on carbon of $30 per ton starting January 1 of this year and to shutter all the coal plants by 2030. Pretty ambitious goal. Uh, if, if you look at it. Uh, in the U.S., we haven't had the courage to put a price on carbon, but I want to tell you why we should. In the markets, if you look at the green curve, that's uh, SO2 mostly, SOX, uh, SO2, SO3. By having a price on it, we reduced it by a factor of four in a decade. By putting a price on NOx, uh, nitric oxides, we reduced it by a factor of three. We have reduced the carbon output average for the PJM system, about 180 pounds per megawatt hour, driven mostly by natural gas, a little bit by the wind that you saw, 5,000 megawatt of wind. But uh, we, we can make major changes in the fuel, and we are doing so as we speak. And that's, we talked about HVDC. HVDC adds controllability to the grid. Uh, if I have a HVDC terminal, and I call this back-to-back, -back, it just goes across the Hudson River to Long Island from New Jersey, but we can actually direct the power flow instead of it being an open network. We can say, I, I want to move 1,000 megawatts today and dial that into the computer and move it. And if there's a problem on the AC system, we can change the DC very rapidly uh, uh, in order to take care of that contingency. So. This is a voltage source converter. Uh, South China presented a paper at my request uh, where they're using the voltage source converter as a STATCOM uh, device uh, uh, to control the AC voltage regardless of the throughput of the DC side. So, Back in my life, I was in charge of electric system reliability in the 1980s. My biggest two challenges were lightning and squirrels. Now, that sounds de minimis, but... Uh, we took on lightning with metal oxide varistors, the West Point, Mississippi, EPRI device, uh, 1985 or six, I think, in there, Bob. And we took on squirrels with squirrel guards uh, the, on the transformers. 
Now, the Skrull guards started tracking, and they were blowing up. Uh, uh, we had to redesign, but that was a pretty simple world. In today's world, I want to take you forward from where we were in the year 2000 and tell you where we are today. Just very quickly, uh, I'll walk through what we thought the future was and what it really turned out to be. In the year 2000, avoid gas at any price. Volatility is crazy. The prices in the energy and gas market had gone off scale. In the 1970s, it was against the law to burn natural gas. Today, natural gas is king. Due to technology created by DOE to a large part, the horizontal uh, drilling and boring, uh, natural gas has half the carbon content. And it may be public enemy number two here in California after Alicia Canyon, but it's much better than coal as we look at it. Nuclear, we had the AP-1000. I was involved in paying for the first license. $60 million went into doing the analysis for the new standardization uh, today. Uh, poised for a renaissance. Of Fukushima happened, and today uh, nuclear. Diablo Canyon surprised even me that they would announce this early, the shuttering of a nuclear plant here in California. The nuclear renaissance pretty much stalled. We have plants now that are being priced out of the market in PJM because gas prices are cheaper than the operation of nuclear plants. In the year 2000, digital tech was forecast to speed up hard drives. We were looking at digital hard drives. We were working Intel was improving processor speed. Today, digital tech is very much focused on distribution systems and energy storage. You may have heard of a conference here. It's called Bits and Watts. That's where a lot of the Bits and watch will be applied in the distribution. So, uh, boring, keep the squirrels out of the line, keep the trees out of the line, make it safe so people don't get hurt. Distribution was just plain old boring. Today, uh, distribution is the platform in New York for microgrids and other grid connected, tens of millions of devices, prices to devices in the market that we can do. Uh, distribution has changed considerably. Carbon capture and storage, worldwide emphasis on R&D. We had projects going at U.S., projects in China. Today, there's two projects in North America, one in Mississippi that's coming in at $11,000 per kW, which is uh, $3,000 per kW, more than a nuclear plant uh, on carbon capture and storage. And there's a project uh, up in Alberta, right on the edge of Sasquatchian in, in Alberta, where I've been working, uh, that's demonstrating uh, oil, advanced oil removal, with, but not much moving on carbon capture and storage. Wind and solar, too expensive, not in anybody's budget. We're not planning for it, we're not building it, nobody knows it's coming. Price of solar, thanks in part to, to Arun, he wrote a, a goal uh, based on JFK's moonshot. He said, uh, sunshot for a dollar a watt. Now that's poetic, uh, but it also sends a signal that we want to get to $1,000 a kW, that solar would cost about the same as a new gas plant in the system. We have built more solar and wind than any other resource, yet in the year 2000, uh, we didn't have a budget or a plan to add that. Now that I've convinced you that we didn't know what the heck we were talking about in the year 2000, I'm going to take you forward in time and tell you what's really going to happen. <laughs> High future load growth, low load growth. Uh, Dan Riker's not here, but uh, 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 something he said that I really like, we built the fridge to the 21st century. I said fridge, not bridge. Uh, each refrigerator is 50% more efficient. Each heat pump uh, sear number is m more than double what the heat pump that it replaces. We've gotten much more efficient. Each light bulb LED uses 20% of the energy. We will have low load growth in electricity. That means low revenue growth. That also means an opportunity as we go forth to find ways to do that. The only hope in CIRA, uh, I like the consulting firm, uh, Larry Makovich thinks we'll have load lo higher load forecast because of electrification of transportation. If that happens, I think it's a very good thing carbon-wise. It's a very good thing efficiency-wise. Uh, my Chevy Volt, I spend about four cents a mile 
my wife's car is 18 cents a mile and my Chevy pickup truck, I don't want to know. Uh, but the bottom line is I think the load growth will be very small, less than 1%, maybe negative. Uh, concentration of fuel portfolio, high diverse fuel, lots of mix. Uh, gas is king right now, uh, it, and we will have a lot of natural gas coming in. Alberta looks like Pac-Man after the year 2030, uh, and the yellow being natural gas, if you can imagine a pie chart uh, with that shape. So uh, we will see natural gas. Uh, we will see renewables, but they're, they're uh, energy, not capacity. Uh, distribution, self-supply, smaller units versus centralized supply, large units, the answer to that is yes. You're going to have both. Uh, the efficiency of a very large unit uh, is 60%. Uh, the smaller units uh, is smaller. So, But because of reliability and the need for microgrids and backup supplies, we'll see both of those develop. And autonomous microgrids, people going off the grid, you hear that a lot, not going to happen. There will be a California ISO and a PJM Long after I'm gone, uh, there will be large. Now, when there's a storm event, there may be both. Uh, so we're kind of at a crossroads here between <laughs> uncertainty and prosperity. How are we going to go? I want to say that thanks to EPRI, uh, Robert. Uh, uh, I was on the EPRI board, and this is something we worked on. This is the grid as we built it, as built drawing. Generation on the left, load on the right, nothing political about that, just the way the drawing was made. <laughs> Uh, but the bottom line is one direction flow across the transmission network. We're going to move very quickly to DER and, and uh, what we're working on. We're going to say energy, environment, and efficiency uh, are all one program that we work together. And I might say that drives our economy, which is fairly important to all of us. The pessimist uh, complains about the wind. The optimist says the wind will change a leader says, I can't change the wind, but I'll adjust my sails. And I think if we look at the weather that we've been seeing, the extreme, we've got to change the way we're doing business. The grid of the future will look more like a ring bus to those that are in the power department that has many opportunities to input and remove from the markets resources, both demand side and supply side, both small generators and large generators, that has much more flexibility than the grid that we've built to date. I want to close with a story on nuclear plants. Fukushima, how many people have heard of Fukushima? Everybody in the room. How many people have heard about Fukushima Diana? Not Daiichi, few, great. Two different management approaches to two different disasters that happened from the same tsunami. Both of these uh, Mach 1 GE nuclear reactors the earthquake did not damage either plant. The tsunami caused a power outage to both plants. In the case of Daiichi, they got focused on how can I get pumps, how can I get fire engines, how can I get cooling into the reactor, et cetera. They were very much focused mechanical. In the case of Diana, they were very focused on where is the closest hot transformer that I can drop cable, just like New York City, and within hours, not days, they drop 5.5 miles of cable to a distribution transformer and started the pumps to cool the reactor, and there was no, uh, there was no major hydrogen explosion, no major damage to the fuel. The fuel was damaged, I, I didn't say that. No ma major damage to the reactor, in essence. So, uh, very different stories, very close together in terms of how they happen. But the more important thing is that when things are written in stone, especially by old geezers like me and Robert, pay attention to, to what they say. Uh, this was actually a stone that was run in, and I had to go to a little bit of trouble of getting a, a, a real good picture of that stone from the New York Times. But it was a tsunami stone uh, and it said, do not build your house below this elevation 1270, excuse me, 127.6 uh, feet. Uh, and it was carved in stone. Uh, and I might add, we built two nuclear reactors and more uh, below that elevation. So we didn't learn from what happened in the past going forward. This, 
Yeah, 1896, not that far back when you think about it. This is carved in stone uh, as I wind down, and I've got a minute and a half to go so I can tell this story. Uh, 108 years ago, this was carved in stone at Union Station, Washington, D.C. Electricity, care of light and power, devourer of time and space, bearer of human speech over land and sea, greatest servant of man. Nothing has improved our standard of living more. Nothing has improved our economy and productivity more than the electrification that we've done today. And somebody way back in 1908 saw that coming and saw the value proposition of electricity and carved that. Last thought, the leaders in this room, especially the, uh, uh, the graduate students in this room that are going to become the leaders in our industry, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. You, you saw what we thought in the year 2000, what we actually have today, the best way to get there, and we're going to start on that tomorrow uh, with a symposium that uh, is set up here on campus in, in bits and watts. With that, I've got 11 and a half minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you. So we have some time for questions. Uh, let's have the students and the postdocs take the first shot, and then we can go on to the faculty. Don't shoot, other. please. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Wanting for energy storage, what kind of time scales do you most want in the grid? Is it minutes, hours, day cycles? I love 15 minutes. I'm passionate about 10 hours <laughs> for different reasons. A battery doing load frequency control, 15 to 30 minutes of storage doing this all day will help us manage the load frequency control. I need about 400 megawatts of that in PJM 180,000 megawatt system. If I'm controlling for the wind and the duck curve you've seen in California, or I'm controlling for that hottest day of the year, I need 10 to 12 hours. And right now, pump storage is the only thing that we have that's in that area. Uh, Bob would argue that compressed air energy storage is, but we only have one of those. So uh, at the bottom, it, it very, it's proven technology, I would say, farther than that. Uh, compressed air energy storage firing natural gas with the compressed air that's stored expands the gases. And, but the point is for different functions, you need different, you don't need a whole lot of the batteries and we're going a little bit crazy. I can do with water heaters and mobile batteries what we can do with the large scale uh, energy batteries we've hooked to the system to date. I love flow batteries. Now that's the, that's the other battery that is not discussed very much because we don't have a lot of them up and running, but you can get to the 10 hour kind of storage. Yes. Yeah, kind of share some of your skepticism a little bit on the, you know, like the power system of the future of being all, everything but microgrids or entirely microgrids. I am curious though, um, a lot of the concept about hierarchical controls, um, do you see examples of that being deployed, whether or not small parts of the distribution system can island seamlessly? Uh, do you see hierarchical control applied uh, by the system operators um, to at least control uh, DG, uh, whether or not it's an island. Um, you could argue Texas is an island. It's a 50,000 megawatt island, but uh, and uh, I wouldn't call it a microgrid, obviously. But what I see is the microgrids will happen for reliability purposes, and people are willing to pay more for reliability than they are for their normal efficient use of energy. In the case of Princeton University in Hurricane Sandy, they had a microgrid fired by very inefficient high sulfur diesel engines, but they saved all the research and development that was being done in DNA during that storm. So a lot of the movement to microgrids is a backup for the grid when it fails. In the case of rooftop solar, and if we get to a dollar a watt, it's in the money and you want it, but it will be synchronous with the system until bad things happen. And, and then a combination of solar and storage comes into play in my mind that becomes very attractive uh, in a microgrid environment. But you've got to be efficient, and even the small modular nuclear reactors, 
you've got to be efficient in terms of how you would build out something in a system to make it work. But I, I actually think microgrids are going to happen. Uh, I could argue that uh, my future ex-wife's home, because I left her so many times for storm duty <laughs> in the dark, uh, she has a generator in our home that kicks in and can uh, actually carry part of the grid, uh, part of the load in the home, not the whole, not the whole neighborhood. I'm out of But microgrids are going to happen. Uh, it's it just because of the value of electricity and the, reli the value of reliability of electricity. Yeah. So demand response has taken kind of a beating in the recent PJM capacity auctions and due to some rule changes. What do you see as being the future of DR in, in PJM and other markets? I, I actually have a chart on that for tomorrow. Uh, I, I still see it good, but you have to aggregate it so that it's not just a summer product. Right now we have a summer pro product. We got caught with our plants down in the winter. Uh, during the, uh, the 2014. So it's taking a beating because you can't just control air conditioning and meet the need. So the aggregator has to put the right mix of fuel. I think it will continue to drop some because we have performance penalties if you don't perform. But at the same time, I see it as a huge saving. As a matter of fact, uh, in the recommendation to, uh, that we're working on for Canada, we're saying, hey, having more DR in the grid. And Jerry Brown called me to California four or five years ago to say, what can we do in California to increase the amount of demand response in the market? Um, I, I see it as an integral part, but you have to perform. You can't, it's not a free ride to, to just get a demand ch charge for the summer period only. But it will, it will come back uh, because the, it's much cheaper who would spend billions of dollars on something that's only going to be used 3% of the time? A football stadium and a peaking power plant. That's it. <laughs> so you, you, you have to be able to, to respond when the system needs you to respond in terms of demand response. Any other students or postdocs? Yes. So in terms of the water heater storage, uh -huh. with, with any storage system you're going to have... Um, losses from the conversion back and forth. But I would think with the water heater, the temperatures not being all that high, uh, are, are the losses much worse than with batteries or other systems? And how uh, the can... losses, uh, <laughs> the water heater you saw on the screen, uh, uh, the losses there would be the best of all, better than batteries, because you're lowering the temperature in the tank, not raising it. You're not keeping, you know, 122 degrees all the time. And more importantly, you super insulate the, the larger tanks. Now, I had uh, the BTU police came after me at DOE uh, on the larger storage tank saying that, hey, instantaneous water heater is what you need because it only heats it when you need it and you don't have any losses. That is the worst thing from a system perspective that an operator ever had. You know, hitting you with 15 kW for, for every time somebody turns a faucet on is not what you're looking for on the system. So uh, bottom line is the overall efficiency is pretty good and something that I don't understand exactly the physics of, but uh, actually the element in a resistant water heater, not a, not a heat pump water heater, lasts longer if you're, lower, if you're raising and lowering it rather than being full load on and off. So that surprised me a little bit, but pretty efficient in terms of turnaround efficiency uh, uh, in terms of the water heaters. A better, other, better, much better in pump storage, which is Raccoon Mountain is 76% uh, turnaround efficiency, for example. Another student question. Yeah. Um, so when you look into using EVs to help balance um, some of the fluctuations, how do you balance the needs of the grid with the needs of a, that person who might want to drive in a certain amount of time? Excellent question because uh, I'm a dual fuel sort of guy, whether it's a combined cycle plant, uh, having some number two fuel oil on site, or a car that has nine gallons, both of my electric vehicles have nine gallons of stored uh, fuel uh, called gasoline on board. Uh, in terms of an all electric fleet, which Tesla is pushing pretty hard, you worry a little bit about not meeting the charge, but any good graduate student doing optimization theory, if you plugged into your computer when to be charged, 
you could actually send a signal to optimize between now and then. And I'm not talking about the deep discharge where I empty your battery when the grid needs it. I'm talking about varying the charge rate as you charge the vehicle at night mostly. Cars are on the road two hours a day average, a little less. So 22 hours a day they would be available to do load frequency control. Uh, midday, uh, you would have to have uh, more plug-ins and you'd need more parking that you got here for one thing. <laughs> but you would need more plugs uh, in terms of, uh, and PJM was a great place to work. They had electric plugs and free electricity <laughs> so, <laughs> during the day. But the point I was gonna get to is the cars are not in use a large part of the time. So you can actually use those batteries and you avoid the warranty if you do the deep, uh, if you do vehicle to grid that you're trying to pull the grid. And the first time we tried to control that one megawatt battery that I put in the parking lot I was talking about, uh, we emptied the battery and then we filled the battery and we emptied the battery. And fill, so we came up with an algorithm that says, you do this while the slow uh, what's through boiler does the ramping for the system, so. But, uh, okay, let's open it up for other people. Yeah. Yep. You have a one, tipping point one. in the cost uh, per kilowatt hour for batteries to take over. And as you have a, you have a say, if we get to this point, then that'll, we'll be able to go all battery. I don't, uh, the best I've seen is EOS talking $160 per kilowatt hour in that range. That's a very good cost. Uh, I, I hope it has an inverter. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's just for the battery. That's just the battery, uh, and there's not an inverter, as Bob is saying. But uh, back to my point, the batteries, for them to make it big, they can do it in the load frequency control market. Uh, Raccoon Mountain Pump storage was $10 per kilowatt hour. And of course, I had hair on top, and it was a long time ago. Uh, the, the bottom line is the uh, pump storage has not been built lately because of the um, there's not a large diurnal swing in price now. Gas prices are so low, you don't have the big differential peak to off peak. But for the load frequency control and the wind integration, I think uh, you the externality that storage has to be priced outside the energy market. It has to be ancillary services, which in PJM is the case. Uh, with demand side management we were talking about earlier, it's paid through the capacity market. Well, I think we've, we've come to an end uh, for all the questions. We I'll are out of time. Uh, but let's just thank Terry again. Oh, it's and for just wonderful.